Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's time to start the, the session on contributed papers. My name is uh, Dr. Stephen Henriksen. I'm a card-carrying neuroscientist, and I'm on the board of ANFA, and I've been since the beginning of the organization. Um, this contributed session is, uh, uh, is about how educational environments impact um, learning, and as I've said to several attendees today, one of the very first uh, workshops that ANFA held a number of years ago was essentially on this subject, and it's so wonderful to see the development and growth of the ideas around um, this principle. In fact, uh, I was uh, at one point in time a, a, a board member of a school on a school district, and uh, 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 John Dale just told me uh, 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 earlier today that, in fact, the last uh, school that was built in the school district his firm had, had done fairly recently, so that's a, f a full circle again. So let me introduce the authors of the paper. First of all, uh, John Dale. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a principal in Harley Ellis Davaro. Uh, David Zanvliet, uh, Assistant Professor of Education at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. Claire Gallagher, uh, PhD um, in Architectural Education, Advisor of the Council of, of ANFA and Professor at uh, uh, Georgia, Georgian Coast University in, uh, in uh, New Jersey. And finally, Margaret Tramp, she's always a pleasure to introduce. She's been a, a, a a daughter of Anfa from the very, very beginning where her educational career in architecture and in, uh, in neuroscience began. And right now she's, I guess, a, a postdoctoral fellow in uh, UCS, uh, UCSB Santa Barbara in the Center of Spe uh, Special Studies. So John, would you like to uh, start off? I'm going to say a very few brief words and, and turn the introduction over to Margaret, but I just wanted to point out that we deliberately uh, brought together four people engaged in the research of learning environments from very different points of view. So a practicing architect, uh, an architect who teaches design and architecture, um, an educational, um, uh, you know, a, a, a university professor and educator, and a neuroscientist. and. Um, we are going to be asking questions more than answering questions today, but we wanted to share the journey we're going through with you. Um, just, I'm just going to provide a little background about how this group got together. Um, John is, uh, leads the AIA Committee on Architecture for Education. Uh, Claire is the vice president who's going to be taking over um, soon. And what's really unique about the AIA uh, CIE is that they have a research task force and they have identified research as being important to the practice of architects. They've uh, compiled a group of psychologists, neuroscientists, um, and architects who do research um, in and around learning environments to kind of inform their efforts in developing a knowledge base for architects to create spaces that are going to be optimal or facilitate learning in uh, positive ways. And I think this is perhaps unique within the AIA. Um, and so I got involved um, with this group as a task force member. We then uh, met David because he is a member of another organization, which I, American Education Research Association, um, where we give a, gave a presentation to them. And the idea was that we realized that we're all using the word learning environments, but in different ways. Within our dis different disciplines, uh, there's different definitions, and this is a common thread all the time as we try to actually engage in uh, collaborative research. So how do we do this? And um, the way that we've found is that as we start to have these dialogues with each other, we can then take that to inform um, our own work within our disciplines. And this is kind of our different perspectives on how the others 
um, work and research and disciplines have influenced uh, their practice. I'm Claire Gallagher, and my job today is really to establish some thoughts about the history of school design and some things that persist in school design. So I was inspired because I had just watched the US Open when I put this slide together. But So resonance, you know what it feels like when you hit a ball on the sweet spot of a tennis racket. To describe it is a difficult thing, but you know how it feels when that happens. Resonance in school design, you know you, how you, you feel, but you have a hard time describing it. So our, the search is to put your finger on what this is, and that's why we're all here today. All of us have been investigating this through different means and with different, different mechanisms, but the goals are all the same. So the premise is that architects are seeking resonance in school design. And over the last 100 plus years, there are some things that have persisted in school design, and the question that I am investigating is why and what those things are. So has it been the result of a collaboration between the client and the designer, which is what architects certainly seek, um, or is it something else? Could it be intuitive? I'm not quite sure. So from a historical perspective, is it intuitive, or is there some portion of this that's intuitive? When Crow Island School was designed, was this process an intuitive process for the people who designed it? I don't know the answer to that, but this is what's keeping me going. Or for Julia Morgan, for instance, there, I was struck this morning by some of the designs that we saw from the students showing some things that are in her school designs as early as like 1914, 1908. Um, this is one that's a little bit later, 1924. And on the right, you can see some of the things that she was encouraging throughout all of her school designs. Or in her Catherine Delmar Burke School, uh, she is really looking at how to encourage community and allowing children to run outdoors with their eyes and their feet, which is one of my favorite quotes from her in her school designs. Uh, she's connecting children with other children. She's connecting them with the outdoors. She's not hermetically sealing them in a room. Or her Marysville school, which is the one that struck me this morning when I was thinking about this, um, as well as Lakeview, that a series of small play sheds that are connected by um, a walkway, a covered walkway, the use of outdoors for learning, uh, an encouraging a sense of community, an open gallery, all things that we were seeing again this morning. Or Frank Lloyd Wright in his school for his aunts, the Hillside Home School, which again was a collection of buildings, uh, domestic and open spaces, connections to the outdoor. And the, the pedagogy matches the school, which to me is part of the resonance. And that's the mission that I have, which is to connect the training of pre-service teachers with the design of schools, to populate the schools with people who are equipped to teach there. Or, for instance, with Frank Lloyd Wright in the Little Dipper Kindergarten, um, this again has a lot of the things that were discussed this morning, not only scaled to children, but connecting children to the outdoors. So this is a provocation, and I'm kicking off this discussion. How do we hit the sweet spot in the design of environments for teaching and learning? Can we find a common language? Margaret mentioned that a moment ago. Can we learn from the past? seeking those in other disciplines who are looking for the same types of things we are through different means. And those on this panel are going to discuss this from their own points of view. So I'm representing, um, you know, the practice, the profession in the trenches. And this is um, really research in the field or research on the fly. Um, because I think for many of us who practice and practice in the field of school architecture, um, we are moving quickly, we're moving forward with limited resources, and uh, we don't always have the opportunity to do the kind of thorough research we need to do to understand how we impact learning with what we do. 
So this is an example of what we refer to as a pilot project where um, we have school district who with very, you know, a very familiar story, facilities that have not been touched for decades, furniture that represents what was state of the art 30 years ago, and um, not yet the money to move forward with the kind of improvements they need to make. So we um, suggested that we do a pilot project which meant stripping some existing classrooms, two in each of four high schools, and bringing in um, furniture vendors and radically changing the environment simply through furnishing in a very different way and then engaging teachers who were willing to experiment and try to do things in a way they really hadn't had the opportunity to do. So um, we, we, uh, we were able to cover a lot of ground. Um, two classrooms in each high school rotated four times with four vendors and we were able to record the reactions of the teachers and students as we did that. Um, so uh, why focus on furniture? You know, for, for teachers, it's a means to facilitate multiple ways of learning simultaneously. Um, and, you know, the selection of really versatile furniture and equipment becomes a strategic decision. Uh, we have the opportunity of creating learning environments that boost morale, that create comfort, that promote student and teacher health, um, and provide students with choices for how they learn best, how to increase engagement and perhaps even decrease behavioral problems in the, in the process. Here's one example where um, uh, furniture systems were used to kind of quickly envision how a standard classroom could be radically reconfigured in a very easy way. And uh, another one actually taking a larger classroom and doing a similar thing. So these are just two of a number of different vendors. And when you see um, the classroom in action, um, it, it would be interesting to think about whether what you see here uh, is ordered and logical or it's actually more chaotic. Um, and, and when you see the way th things move, when you actually see it in action and you hear, you, you hear the cacophony when people are all working and doing things at the same time, uh, it may actually be more on the chaotic side. Um, one of the great things about an educational environment like this is that we were able to do on-the-spot surveys and get a very high rate of return if the teacher asks the student to fill out a form or, or, or or complete one online, the rate of return is very high. There's a kind of, that's the, the advantage of this environment. So uh, we had almost a thousand uh, responses to our survey. But starting with the teacher survey, it is interesting to um, look both at a quantitative uh, response and a more qualitative response. And I'll just read part of this quote. You know, the movable adaptive desk assists students in many ways the most important being that they are super, super easy, flexible, pairs, trios, solo students feel comfortable adapting the environment for each activity. They arrange themselves to meet the needs of the people and the demands of the task. And, and then this last statement, I have enjoyed greater engagement and intrinsic motivation more than I've ever known. The new room is amazing. And this is just a stripped down room with different furniture. Uh, this is... Uh, the survey that we developed for the students, so um, it was really about trying to measure the perception of ease of learning, of enhanced learning uh, through a different kind of, through uh, an environmental change. And of course the beauty of this is it was a very isolated thing we were doing. We weren't changing a lot of things. We were only changing one aspect of the environment. So these were the questions and this is a kind of broad summary and you can see you know a very positive response this is of course a bit simplistic but um, you know, a lot of the perception uh, with the simple move is that learning was enhanced learning was easier and that that was very interesting to see the strength of that response and then the the quotes of the students are interesting too the new room makes us excited and happy to come to class uh, it has a modern look and is a more comfortable environment to learn in. 
The desks and chairs are easy to move, which has made learning easier. We no longer have bulky furniture that's hard to move. Instead, we have furniture that moves with a breeze. The chairs don't hurt my back, and we finally have room to move around. I wish every class was like this. And then the last word from one student that really hit us was this phrase. It's pretty sick, which means it's pretty good. And um, that kind of takes us full circle to this question of language and what we mean by what we say. And um, implicit in this brief exploration is the question of what is the learning environment? Is the learning environment the relationship between a particular student and the instructor and the electricity between them? Is the classroom, how much does the classroom have to do with it? How much do the way, in way the ways in which it's arranged and changed create that environment? So um, this is, these are the questions that we want to put forward and continue to think about with you. So my name is David. I'm a professor of education at Simon Fraser University um, in Canada. And um, I guess my background is I was actually trained as a marine biologist and ecologist before I became a teacher. Um, then worked as a teacher for many years, and now I'm training prospective teachers. And my my institute really focuses. I'm not. I guess I'm not the typical teacher, which made me open to this idea of looking at the built environment. I'm an environmental educator, so I'm quite critical of schools and more historical uh, structures related to schools. And I do a lot of my teaching in field settings with school children and de-schooling teachers, if you would. So that's kind of my background. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about a conference that, that we're, we're collaborating on, actually, in the future. But um, I'm also a learning environments researcher, but I use that term quite differently than these folks. And this is my view of the learning environment. and. Actually, educators, you know, my colleagues, I, I'm representing the AERA, which is the American Educational Researchers Association. We just celebrated last year our 10th anniversary of being a special interest group, a research group within that organization. Um, and most educators think about a learning environment from a social perspective only. So it's got to do with students' perceptions of their school experience. And there's a lot of research methodology around the design of questionnaires to pick up on students' perception of their learning experience, which is driven, really, the way I look at it. I, I think of myself as a classroom ecologist now because of my background in ecology. Um, there are social factors certainly at play, but educators rarely think about the physical environment. Uh, and I could tell many stories about actually how many school environments are, you know, bordering on toxic, um, you know, low oxygen, high CO2 levels, but new technology in the classroom and that sort of thing. Um, we also talk about sort of new approaches in, in, in teaching, I think, maybe using technology, using inquiry-based learning, um, using uh, different modes of teaching and learning than the traditional classroom-based can also have a huge impact on students' perception for their learning. So I look at those three things together and how those interplay. That's my background. Uh, I'm often kind of considered heretical in my field for actually considering the physical environment. There are actually people that caution me you know, that really has no influence whatsoever. When I talk to educators, they believe that. Um, so I won't read this, but um, there is an increasing um, focus, I think, in the last five or six years um, in the literature that educators are starting to realize, oh, maybe we need to sort of pay attention to the physical environment. Um, and the way campuses are designed. And, it, and it's not actually new, because as Claire showed, some of the older architecture that was out there was thinking like this 100 years ago, but somehow 
it got lost in the conversation for, for many years for educators to be thinking like this. But it's a classic behavior context. So I started thinking as a researcher, how could we start to quantify student perceptions of the learning environment that would include the physical? So um, that's what I'm going to share with you today very briefly. We actually designed a survey and it started off looking at just the literature and ergonomics and environmental psychology, etc., cetera, to, to find out, okay, what are we reading about that's theoretically kind of important to consider? And we came up with these scales, the spatial environment, the architectural elements, scale and aesthetics of the building, ambient factors, and the visual environment. And uh, in our earlier studies, we just basically wanted to um, find out which of these factors, um, whether the students that used these spaces would consider these to be important factors in their learning. So we ended up validating a questionnaire, um, kind of a, a five-point response to these. There were about 25 factors. Now this is just a little visual. I find it really interesting, actually, this slide. Um, first of all, it showed us, um, there's some background to this that showed us that actually our constructs were relevant, the questionnaire worked, and people had different ideas about these different aspects of the building and how important they would be. And, you know, architectural elements was pretty high, as well was the visual environment, but ambient factors, things like um, quality of the air and that sort of thing was completely off the radar for most students and most educators, they were like, that's not really important. But the survey worked. So then I got this other opportunity, um, being a researcher. In my community, there was a brand new $58 million school being built, Le LEED certified. It's kind of the state-of-the-art school in my province in British Columbia, Canada. And it turned out that a couple of people in that school were former graduate students of mine and I very found my I found myself invited to come in and do kind of a quasi post occupancy evaluation as all these students entered the new building for the first time uh, so I think there were about 600 students um, and they said well would you like to try out your questionnaire with this nice population of 600 students and I thought wow, what a great opportunity. I don't even need any funding. All the teachers were running around photocopying my surveys and bringing them to their class. And when the teacher gives the student a questionnaire, as John was saying, it tends to get filled out. So what did I find out? Well, this is really interesting. Um, so I think, you know, they spent $58 million on this school. And that pattern, you know, they nailed some things, but that uh, factor, ambient factors, that wasn't important, turned out to be really important in this design. They nailed everything else, but they missed that. And um, the story to tell here, actually I shared this with the superintendent of schools and the principal, and I did some interviews afterwards, and it turned out the school has a, a foods program, so they're doing chef training, and something about how the ducting had been designed in the school, everyone got to smell lunch being made at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> and that was a real problem. In fact, that kind of actually distracted everyone away from all the $58 million of bells and whistles. It was easily fixed, um, but it just struck me as being sometimes these things that are really important are kind of off the radar. So. We had some interesting conversations about that. Um, we also did a little drawing activity. So this was one of the other ways we corroborated the factors. We asked students to draw their favorite formal and informal settings in the schools. And then we analyzed those drawings to see whether our factors were showing up in the drawings. In other words, did students independently comment on these? And it turned out that was a really nice way to corroborate the factors in the survey as well. So things like 
ambient light. This is a picture of the library, for example, com comfortable furniture, etc. Very important. Feeling comfortable. I call it the Starbucks phenomenon, right? Um, uh, the students actually named the Grand Hall. It was like an entranceway. They said, this is so cool. We should, <coughs> we should call it the Grand Hall. And again, in the drawings, you can see modular seating, giant windows, this interface between outside and inside, and some notion of uh, grand scale. So that's a very quick look at what's becoming a major focus of my research. And uh, we're, we're talking a lot about um, how to kind of interface across disciplines. And I'm very lucky to have run into this crowd. And uh, we've actually um, added, a, I'm hosting a large conference next year in Vancouver in the LEED Platinum uh, Design Convention Center in Vancouver. And I have postcards I'll hand out before you leave, but we've added a architecture um, strand to that environmental education congress so thank you okay so what i'm going to talk about is how do we go about integration now i think that's one of the issues that um, from both in architectural practice, how do we integrate neuroscience? And it, it was wonderful to see the student pro uh, projects which went through this exercise. How do you take what we know from neuroscience and apply it to design right now? But then also, how do we, um, as researchers from all these uh, other disciplines, also integrate uh, what we know from, from neuroscience and um, architecture? As Stephen had said earlier, um, my background in all of this is I was involved even before AMFA had started um, working with John Eberhard in 2001. And I think you know it's a real pleasure to see many of the people who are really passionate about this still part of um, this effort. But um, since that time, I think one of the things that I've always struggled with is this question of why neuroscience. Um, and while this, I, I love using this quote because, you know, while it's maybe crude, it's very memorable, right? So Ramachandran says, I doubt very much whether anyone could have figured out how the digestive system works by simply looking at its output, right? So, um, so what this suggests is that the processes, like, you know, it's, it's, I think, perhaps an imperfect analogy, but it suggests that the processes in the brain can illuminate our understanding um, in a way that's different um, than other disciplines. And the way that I see neuroscience's role in this is to further test theories uh, of human behavior and cognition and learning. And so we can look to neuroscience as a way to inform our work without necessarily having to do neuroscience research. And so that's what I'm going to suggest here. Um, so from a neuroscience perspective, in a very simplified way, we can think of learning as involving uh, changes of the brain. And this idea is neuroplasticity, so our ability, the ability of neurons to change and reorganize. Um, in an experience-dependent manner where genetic factors and the environment um, in which a person lives, along with the actions of that person, play a significant role in that plasticity. Um, and so it's really about the connections uh, of these neurons, both creating the connections and also pruning connections to increase the efficiency of the brain. And um, I think in our interests here in terms of environments is what is the role of the environment in neuroplasticity? If we use neuroplasticity as, um, as a, you know, a placeholder for learning. And so we know from this early work that really inspired much of the development of, of AMFA um, from 
rusty gauge that enriched environments increase neuroplasticity. And you can see it's more than just um, the built environment, right? It's visual, motor, cognitive, somatosensory aspects in which the environment can support um, these components. On top of that, I think it's important to also note that studies suggest that kind of proper social relationships may st also stimulate neural um, plasticity that's required for certain kinds of learning. And so enriched environments, there is plenty of support now through the years that's shown um, how we can increase the size of cortex, importantly, um, increase the number of synapses or connections between neurons. Um, enriched environments have been shown to uh, be able to improve, um, you know, early brain damage and um, genetically based learning deficits in adult rats. Um, and I think this is interesting to note that this is not just in um, what we'd consider uh, children, but also in adults. And uh, this idea that we can still change our brains um, even as uh, older individuals. And so to summarize, learning environments can foster or hinder neuroplasticity. Um, and if we think about neuroplasticity as our, our general ability to learn, we can infer from the research uh, what may be beneficial to learning, and that is perhaps enriched environments. And so we can use neuroscience findings as guidance or motivation in developing studies or creating designs, um, but within our own disciplinary bounds. And so one example I'd like to use is um, Fuji uh, Kindergarten by Tezuka Architects, and where we can form testable hypotheses based on the neuroscience findings in conjunction with the tacit knowledge um, that architects use to design environment or uh, design um, educational spaces. I think another important point to make is that architects' tacit knowledge is not something that we should completely, we shouldn't just disregard it. It's in a very important component in terms of understanding or pushing forward, I think, this effort. Um, Fuji Kindergarten is widely held, it, uh, hailed, it's won numerous awards, and um, we can then look at the correspondence between uh, the design and what we know from neuroscience findings, which um, environments which, you know, increase uh, plasticity or foster plasticity. And in all of these images, I think you should note that um, the social learning setting um, that these, these children are in, they're not at individual desks. They're um, always interacting with each other and with the environment. And so there's a wonderful correspondence between um, all those components. And so we can see these open classrooms as this visual component, seeing each other's, making these visual connections, just the sensory experience. You hear the noise from other classrooms. You hear the noise of, of kids interacting with each other and with teachers. Even when you're on top of the roof, kids can look down into the classrooms. So again, you have more visual connections. Um, the kindergarten roof is, is built as a circle, so kids can run around. So there's this motor component. They can slide down to class. They can climb up to class. Um, there's these, I think we can consider cognitive components of exploring their limits, exploring the space in a way that challenges um, you know, their own diff different developmental levels. They can you know, use kind of divergent thinking to think about how these, what, you know, when they're turned around, they're used as chairs, and then these kids use them as uh, trains. And then this idea of this somatosensory component, this tactile tension and compression of this space that they wanted to 
you know, maintain this uh, tree. And so instead of putting a rail around it, they made it something that's climbable, that's explorable by, this, by the students. And so I think, uh, again, I'll end on this, this quote. The idea is that, um, you know, to know what we should design or what we should focus on in our research, um, in order to do that, we need to be informed by other disciplines. We don't necessarily have to engage in neuroscience research ourselves. Not everyone has the ability or the resources to do EEG on the fly, do fMRI, or do any um, some of these more popular but expensive uh, neuroscience approaches, but it doesn't mean that we can't build on that uh, research, those research findings in order for us to all kind of come to or advance forward um, what we're all interested in, is to, is, which is finding out what is the relationship between our environments and behavior, cognition, um, happiness, learning, whatever. And so um, we're going to move to a discussion period. Um, we're, we just like to invite comment or question now. Yeah, we just have five minutes, so would any thoughts from the audience? comment from can, tell us more <laughs> we're obviously a little uh, none of us have the expertise Thank you very much. Great observation. Anyone else? Yeah. Sort of following on that um, is this notion of is the classroom the best place to be learning at all? Um, I do all of my courses nomadically. Our students move around the campus. They choose where they want to learn. They never choose a classroom, ever. They choose places that they like, comfortable seating, good coffee, frequently other noise, as we saw with the teaching in kindergarten. And, but I also find, following on the Diane's point, is that they remember better the content because they, it, the campus becomes a mnemonic device. Mm -hmm. They remember what we talked about in a, a particular place and can recall it more easily by remembering that place. So all of that research suggests, you know, why do we teach, uh, teach 
working in the same places. Um, and because it's not how like some careers are, you know, how we evolve to learn. I, I think that's a, a, a really excellent point, and I think um, you, you, you may find it of interest to look at the awards program the Committee on Architecture for Education does, and, and you will see the kind of selection, the award winners very much embody those principles. We really today are looking at much more varied environments where flexibility has to do with variety and specificity and much less to do with the kind of idealized or universal environment. So again, a point very well taken. Thank you. May I also add that um, one thing that hasn't been discussed is what children say about where they want to learn. And when asked, uh, there are several studies um, out of the UK, when asked, children don't talk about classrooms. Classroom to them is something, it's something very different. Um, in my own work in doing a project in the UK with refugee children, I had them design a city. It was an urban design project that involved uh, many components, but one of the things that happened that was remarkable, speaking of school, is that they had brainstormed the idea that this community, this environment, needed a school, but they wrote it on a card and stuck it on the map and walked on it. They never designed it. It had virtually no meaning to them, really, except that it was a placeholder. They knew it, it should be there. But when asked, they talked about learning everywhere else. They said, the rest of the city is the unschool. And then we, when we would ask them, well, what does that mean? They'd say, well, this is where you learn everything, not in that place. Um, there's a, a study, The School I'd Like, which is worth noting, if anybody is interested in this at all, that is, um, from 2000, it was a study that was done in the 1960s and repeated in 2000. The results were consistent in both cases and it's a compendium of students' drawings and writings and ideas about school. Can I add a, can I add a comment to this too? Um, one of the big, um, I guess, innovations that's kind of moving around the world right now in the education field and uh, the buzz name for it is called 21st Century Learning and you may be, um, have heard that term. Um, in my province, they just enacted a new curriculum with a, with a very high focus on place-based and community-based kinds of learning. Um, and that's really informing a, a lot of our work. And uh, for example, in the school that I studied, for example, when I, when I was a first-year teacher, the way it used to work was when the big beginning of period happened in a high school, the bell would ring all the classroom doors would close and you know the the hallway you probably remember this yourself the hallway was a surveillance zone the principal could walk out of his office and look straight down the hall and know that everyone was in class right so that assumes that that's the only place where learning happens now in this new school that we studied there are there's deliberate diversity and there are nooks and crannies and all kinds of hiding places in the old terminology where the new way of thinking about teaching and learning is that that's where actually most of the learning is happening is in those informal places outside of the classroom and some teachers are creating more of those so it it shows how pedagogy is changing and so school design has to follow that and those two are really interconnected and so does pre-service teacher training that has to change as well This is a, a topic that's going to continue uh, going forward. Obviously, humanity has not figured out this issue. Either architects or neuroscientists, and I'm sure we'll be welcoming more discussion in the future. Thanks a lot for the panel. Excellent panel. Thank you very much.